I find that it's always our great ability to walk on this path together. On this path of a spiritual journey, we have to deal with uh, a lot of difficulty in life on this earth, but something not to forget is that we always have a spiritual friend that you can find in a temple. So it's important during our lifetime to find a spiritual friend, a Tao brother, sister, that you can hold hands and work together to the end of our physical journey. And hopefully we can do it all together and we can all see each other in heaven. Today we are going to do chapter 24. The title is Make Your Flight to Heaven Luggage Free. Lao Tzu is wonderful. He reminds us how to go to heaven, what not to bring. And today we are going to talk about four important luggage that we should not bring to Tushida heaven when we take our last breath. So let's begin with our chapter title. We will start from the Chinese part, which is uh, so Chang Zhang. As you know, human is made out of two parts that we all know. Let's start from the left side. The body part that we are pretty much aware of. So everything has its physical part and the non-physical part. The physical part, it's everything that you know. We all been through birth and we are in the aging process and we've been through sickness. The only thing that we have not experienced is death. So during this uh, process of uh, birth to sickness, we spend a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time on pursue on our wish our desire, fame, status, wealth, and power. Sometimes we pursue our status in our family too. So people spend a lot of time pursuing this uh, target, but it's a target, it's difficult to achieve because this is a moving target. Every time when you achieve something, that target move. And then when you target to the next one, it move again. So. It has to do with our programming. Our false self wants us to shoot for the target, but that target is constantly moving. So how can you ever fulfill your wish, fulfill your desire, and fulfill your wants? How can we do that? Lao Tzu suggests us that no longer to pursue our moving target, we should pursue on our essence, which is something that will not move. It did not move before, and it will not move in the future, which is the permanence part. So in contrary to the existence, the existing part is the body, the false self. But on the other hand, on the right side is the soul and the true self. So now let's ask us, have you ever existed before our current life? The answer is yes. How long did you exist? It did not have a beginning. It exists before the creation of the earth. It exists before the creation of heaven. And how long will it last? It will last after you take your last breath here. It will continue to last after your next life. And after your next, next, next life, it will still continue to exist. So that's our true self. And our true self is not a moving target. It's always there. It will be with you always, regardless what form and what body you change. So when I say true self, I don't want you to just so focus on the words. So the true self can also interpret as uh, true, true nature. In Confucius, he used the term conscience. And in the Western spirituality, people refer this term as higher self or higher being. Lao Tzu refer this term as Tao. In Hinduism, this true self is referred as Atman. And of course, in the uh, English translation, we call it soul too. So the permanence part, which is the soul and the true self, it's not a moving target. It's always there. So why don't we focus our life on something that's permanent? If we focus our life on something permanent, we will achieve what we want in the impermanence. If you want to have a better life, if you want to have a better career, if you want to have a better marriage, if you want to have a better job, better parents, better family environment, better work environment, why not work start from the permanence part, which is this part. Follow your true nature, everything will come along. However, 
if you focus on your impermanence and not focus on your permanence, then everything will go against your will. I want to give you a, a great example. On a boat, say on a cruise, um, there's so many passengers, right? And then there's a lot of uh, cruise ship member, waiter, there are chef and many people on um, the cleaning crew, but how many captain are there? Probably just one or a few. So to put it as an analogy here, the captain is our true self and all the other people are our false self, which is our body, our family culture, everything that you can think of in this uh, realm of duality. So have you thought about when is the last time the captain is being hijacked and being captured in a cabin, not allowed to come out? This is what happened when we are in the depression mode. This is what happened when we feel angry because the captain, our true self is being hijacked. Can you understand this analogy here? So it's important to allow this captain to come out free. This captain is full of good nature. He is sweet, kind, full of benevolence. He has so many virtues. We all have this captain inside of us. Let me ask you a question. Is everybody's captain in good nature? The answer is yes. So you might see that some captains are not in good nature. And that's because this captain is being hijacked by the crew member to be captured in that cabin or in the storage. Everybody's captain all have good nature, everyone, because it's something permanent. It does not change. Our good nature, it's always there, it never change. And it, it will always maintain that way. So then you say, wait a minute, why some people are so evil? Some people are so vicious. Some people are so violent. And that's because their captain is being hidden. It's being trapped. And the captain is not allowed to come out because the captain is being trapped by this uh, false self. So allow to remind us this line here to cultivate our true self beyond the false self. So I talk so many bad things about a false self, but we need this false self. We do need this false self to cultivate our true self. Without our false self, we cannot cultivate our soul. Without our physical body, without our physical vehicle, there's no way that we can manifest our virtue. If I want to express love to you, how can I express without my physical body? it will be very difficult without a physical form. However, with this physical body, I can give you a hug. I can give you a kiss on the cheeks. If we are friends, I give you a fist bump or a high five, or even just to say hello. So everything here with this physical form, physical body, it allow us to express much easier as if we don't have the physical body. So the true self, it's important as well as the false self. In order to cultivate the true self, we need to have the false self. Yeah, so this is our primary test to do while we are alive. So the message here from this Chinese character, let's go back to the first word here, preserve and maintain and keep. How can we manifest our Tao? How can we manifest our true self from within? And how can we manifest our true self? In order to manifest our true self, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to love ourselves. We have to love our Tao, our Atman, our higher self, and spend some quiet time with our higher self. Usually we can spend that time by walking in the nature through meditation. Sometimes when we read a book, we, we can communicate with our true self via those ways. And the second character is always permanent, everlasting. So this character, it refers to the term Tao, which is our soul, our spirit, our higher self, our higher being. So let's go to our chapter here. When I do the Tao Te Ching chapter, I always love to break it down into like paragraph. So the first section is intro. Second one is body. Third one is summary. So it's very interesting. Lao Tzu, 
start from the intro with the first two lines. When standing on tiptoe, one cannot stand long. When taking long strides, one cannot walk far. Let's look at what does Lao Tzu mean here. The first character here means standing on tiptoe, which is this picture here. And this one, literally, it means uh, standing on tiptoe. Figurative meaning is daydreaming, wish, and illusion. And on the second line here, taking long strides. This is what it means here. I, you can see in the picture here. So taking a long strides means um, instead of walking two normal steps, we take one long step. By looking at this two line, the literal meaning is that this person has a short figure. And this person has a short figure want to exaggerate he or she is taller. That's why this person tiptoe. And that's why this person take a long stride so that he can achieve more. Have you ever seen people, they want to exaggerate their power or they want to exaggerate their name by their appearance? Sometimes they will wear something more luxury, although you know that they don't have a wealthy background. And you know that this person probably is from the middle class. But then this person drive a luxury car. I go to a swimming pool every day. Sometimes I will see a man, maybe 60 or 70 years old. He will wear like a Superman red shirt. But the other younger age men, they wear the regular shirts. So I would think that this old man want to find a balance that although he's old, but then he want to use his uh, external clothes to balance his aging. So I find that interesting. So a lot of time, people who are short, they have an internal insufficiency. Perhaps it's in the financial insufficiency or spiritual insufficiency. Maybe it's physical shortage, like, like a short person. They will cover up through their uh, external embellishment. So one thing to remember from this two line is that we want to focus on our internal virtue because if we try to tiptoe or if we try to take a long strides, how long can we last? If you say now tiptoe, how long can you do that? Probably just a few hours. But then if we walk, we can walk probably a longer time. And same thing for taking the long strides. If we take a long strides, our leg will get tired more easily than if we do a normal walk. A lot of rich people, Mark Zuckerberg, this is his closet. <laughs> In order for him to make a decision much easier, he chose to have the same outfit in his closet. And that's very different than the common people here in the society. A lot of ordinary people, they will shop in uh, expensive boutique and they will want to wear something like brand name to show off themselves. And I'm sure none of us are like that. Another example I can give is Steve Jobs. His iconic image is black turtleneck. You can never see him wear something else. Black turtleneck is his icon. So these people, they are rich and they don't need something external to impress other people. So in terms of cultivation, you can use that as an analogy. Kathleen, Duchess of uh, Cambridge, every time she wears something, from the store. The next day it's always sold out. So it shows that how people want to proclaim themselves uh, similar to Kate Middleton. And it also shows that they have some kind of spiritual deficiency. Otherwise they wouldn't pursue this kind of uh, fashion after Kate Middleton. And then here you can see an old man driving a car. Ordinary people display having extra money to show off or people drive red sports car to compensate their old age. Sometimes the older um, generation, they will want to wear younger clothing to compensate their old age. And also knowledge. Have you ever encountered some people who does not know, but they pretend they know? When we display all of this, it's an analogy as this sentence here, we cannot stand long. How long can we camouflage our youth? How long can we camouflage our financial status? How long can we camouflage our financial situation? We cannot. So people who reach the stage of a spiritual 
sufficiency, we will dress casual, we will dress simple because there's nothing to impress about. We will not place much importance on the external embellishment. Especially in the Tao cultivator in the temple, I never see them wear makeup. And I'm the person who does not like to wear makeup. And lucky me, the job that I have does not require me to wear makeup. So I feel so blessed. And the last one I want to share with you is that because we already achieved this spiritual sufficiency, we will be more honest on sharing our knowledge and we will admit what we know. When we are asked something that we don't know, we will just admit that we don't know. So we are going to the next four slide, which talks about the body. This four line is the four luggage that Lao Tzu do not want us to bring. So this four line is a, as a precautious, as a warning that no more people encounter. So as you can see that I have a circle here, not carrying the luggage with us. We have to be off center. We have to put ourselves outside the circle as we are observing ourselves from inside. We have to do that constantly. Constantly meaning by the minute, by the second. The moment that we are in the center, we will become biased. We will become boastful. We will become arrogant. So this takes practice. Imagine somebody who is always self-centered. It will be difficult for them to move themselves out of the circle. Basically, these four lines talks about we should move ourselves out of the circle. This word here, selfless is to have less concern about ourselves. One who is biased cannot have clarity. People view the appearance without seeing the inner essence. When is the last time you judge people from their dress, from the, what they wear, from their height, from their career? We all do that, but we try not to do that. We intend to do that because we are programmed this way. We have our eyes to see. It's difficult not to do that. Therefore, we constantly have to remind ourselves to move ourselves out of the center. And we intend to view the surface without depth. We intend to just look at the superficial thing. We intend to look at the beginning without a closure. Isn't it true that we intend to judge somebody and somebody, maybe this person is not successful. And then we think that, oh, this person not successful. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, maybe he's not going to be successful, but we try not to do that. We intend to view the result without the process. Give you an example. Sometimes we see some people have a good marriage and we think that, wow, this person is so lucky, so fortunate to have a good husband or a good wife. So fortunate and why don't I have? But you just seen a surface, you just seen a result. You don't know how long have they worked on it. Having a harmonious marriage is difficult. You don't know how many arguments they have been through. You don't know how many negotiations they gone through. You don't know how many um, talk they, they went through. They have their high and low. But when we meet our friends outside of their home, we just see that this person has such a great marriage. And also we intend to see, wow, this person has a, a dream job that I want to have, but we don't pay attention or we are not involved in the process. This person maybe worked so hard during the process. This person is humble, is willing to bend right in front of the client, in front of coworker. This person spends so much time working overtime, maybe try many ways to adopt the company culture, to adopt everybody's character, to work with people's temper, to flow around like a water. But we don't see that. We only judge people by, wow, this person has a dream career, such a great karma. How come I don't have good karma? Why do I go through this difficulty? But if you have the clairvoyance, you will know that this person also went through a lot. And if you have that clairvoyance, you will see that how much karmic could see this person planted and how much karmic could see that person planted probably one or two life or three life before this life. And if you have clairvoyance, you can probably see what are the bad karmic seed that we planted in our previous life. Then we can make that judgment. 
And since we are human, not many of us have that clairvoyance. So let's try not to be judgmental, not to be biased. So do not jump into the conclusion so quick. In terms of cultivation, we want to remind ourselves what I see may not be correct. So there's an old man and a dog. Both of them, they lost their life in a car accident. So they both die and they all go up to heaven. So they are walking and finally there was an angel coming. The angel say, welcome here to heaven. Both of you die. Now, in order to go to heaven, you have to go straight. And you see that, that gate right in front of you, but you have to go down the aisle and there's a uh, two line of tree. Yeah, there's a uh, lines of tree. So you go down and then you will see a gate. Both of you are going to race. Whoever reached the end will be able to enter the door of heaven. The other being will have to go to hell. So you can start now. The angel say, you guys can start now. So the old man kneel down and tell his dog. His dog's name is Lucky. Lucky, you stay here. Don't you move. Do not move. And then the old man turned around and he started walking towards to the gate of heaven. And as he was walking, the angel was disappointed. The angel think that this man does not deserve to go to heaven. How can he abandon his dog? The angel turned around to the dog. The angel want to tell the dog, come on, you should go, you should go. But the dog just look at the angel as if I have to be loyal to my owner and I have to obey him. So the dog just sit there without doing anything. And the angel was so disappointed. And the angel condemned that man. This man does not deserve to go to heaven. So as the man walked closer to the gate, again, the angel has a disappointed face and the man turned around and he shouted, Lucky come, Lucky come. And Lucky was so happy and then he ran to the owner. He ran and he ran so fast. He went beyond the man and, and he went into the gate of the, the heaven. So the man was so happy. Wow, I'm so happy. So the angel say, why did you do that? And the old man say, well, Lucky has always been a loyal dog. He always liked to walk behind me. So the only way for him to walk before me is to get him excited. And this is the only way to get him excited. And the angel was so pleased. And the angel said, well, I'm going to make an exception. Both of you can enter the door. And now God appeared. God said, well, you see, you shouldn't be so judgmental. You shouldn't be so judgmental. We should just wait until the closure to make a judgment. So a lot of time between human, between the human relationship, we have a lot of friction. We have a lot of argument, miscommunication. That's because we did not observe until the end. We did not observe until the closure. We only look at the surface. Have we be a little patient? Wait until the end. We will not be so judgmental. One who is assertive cannot be distinguished. I want you to take a look at this three picture here. So basically this line talks about Mr. Right. We are all Mr. Right. <laughs> we are all Mr. Right because we rely on our vision. We rely on our hearing. And it's not our fault because this is part of our programming. However, to be born on this earth is to learn not to rely on our senses. Going back here, one who is assertive cannot be distinguished. Why not be distinguished? Because if I'm always right, every time when you say something, I'm always right, you are wrong, I'm right. Then eventually you will have no friend. You will lose all the credibility. People will not trust you. Even though if you say nine things right and one thing wrong, you still don't have any credit. You will not be distinguished because you are so self-assertive. So that's why this line say, if one is Mr. Right, this person cannot be honored, cannot be trusted, cannot be heard, and will lose all the credibility. So this line, it's about self-opinioned and arrogance. So in terms of cultivation, we often want to observe and reflect on ourselves. As a sage, that's referred to all of us. We are sage to be, 
we, although we are just an ordinary dog cultivator, but we are on our way to become a sage. We are on our way to become a Buddha. We are on our way to become whoever we want to be. We can choose who we want to be. We have a choice. And it's who you want to be. It's whatever you choose, you can be who you want to be. Buddha was once a human and you are a human. Eventually you will get there. So as a sage, a sage to be, we want to constantly see what is our shortcoming. We want to constantly examine where is our fault and our blemish and where is my inadequacy. So here fault, it means like a big mistake and blemish it's something small, something minor. So we constantly want to watch something minor before it gets bigger. And of course we want to minimize our fault and hopefully there's less fault as long as we discover our blemish. One who is boastful cannot be given any credit. So there is a difference between boastful and arrogance. What's the difference? Being boastful is to tell people what you did exactly. So being boastful is to express my accomplishment to you or to others. And being arrogant is to exaggerate what I did in the past. For example, if I'm a salesperson and uh, I have sales experience for five years, but then sometime on the resume, we will say, oh, I have sales experience for 10 years. And uh, so that's like exaggeration. So arrogance, it's uh, exaggerating your achievement. So boastful is just express our achievement. But in this case, Lao Tzu say, don't even mention about it. If you have achievement, just keep it to yourself. So whatever good deed that we do are just fulfilling our vows. So being boastful here is referring to, oh, Jerome, I did something great yesterday. Let me share with you. Oh, I did this. Can somebody advertise for me? Can somebody talk about this? Maybe I, I did something great. Let me put it on Facebook, Instagram, this and that. Now to say, don't even mention about it because this is our inner nature. It's something that we're supposed to do. But as soon as you talk about it, your merit become discounted. On a virtue, it's something that we're supposed to do, but do not mention it. When we mention it, it becomes a pursuit of being praised or being compliment, being recognize, being distinguished. When, every time when we do something good, think about it's something that we are supposed to do. And do not think about the good and the bad. So everything we do is do it according to our original true self. It's merely a manifestation of Tao and the De. So you say, wait a minute, what about my thinking about compassion, mercy, giving and caring. If you are in a higher level of cultivation, this term should not even be in your mind. But for beginning level, sometimes we want to do something, we will say, hmm, I think this is a good thing to do, then I should do it. But your next cultivation level should be, you don't even ask yourself because it's already part of yourself. Let me give you an example. So when you extend a helping hand to a friend, what goes through your mind? I'm helping you because I'm your good friend. I'm helping you because you are going to say thank you to me. I'm helping you because it's a good deed. So when your friend tell you, oh, Joanna, thank you for helping me. What will be your response? The ordinary response will be, oh yeah, sure. I'm your friend. I'm supposed to help you. So this is the, the middle level of cultivation. I do this because this is a good deed. I'm supposed to help you. I'm your friend. But the higher level of cultivation should be, oh no, don't even mention about it. Don't mention about it. It's just me, I am supposed to help you anyway. So even in my mind, I'm not thinking about helping. I'm not thinking about compassion. It's just me. I'm not thinking about those virtue at all. We are not even thinking about, is this good thing to do? Or is this something that I'm supposed to do as a human? Is this because something that I learned from sermon? So I'm doing it. On the cultivation level, there's different level. 
first level is somebody tell you you need to do this, then you do. And the second level is, oh, okay, so I know this is a good thing. I'm supposed to do it. So it goes through my mind. I'm supposed to do it because I read it from the book. Master told me it's good to do. Joanna say it's good, so I'm doing it. However, the next level is, oh, don't even mention about it. I just help you anyway. Here is the next example. There's a homeless dog here. So what comes in your mind? Oh, this dog is so poor. I supposed to extend my empathy to the dog. So let me get a food so that the dog will feel happy. The dog can have a full tummy. So this is a good thing to do. But on the level of higher cultivation will be, oh, let me just do whatever I need to do to help the dog, not even think about the good and the bad. If we are considering this is good and the bad, this is compassion, this is virtue, this is kindness, we are thinking about to be recognized, to give them credit, because we are boastful to the good deed that we do, that's why credit is not given. Doing the virtue with our instinct, Tao, without minding the good and the bad, nor self. So even just not thinking about self, try to remove yourself from the center. This line echo with chapter two. When people recognize good as goodness, evil appear. Because the good and the bad, the good and the bad, uh, when you think about that, it falls into the duality. So try not to think about the good and the bad. And we just do things according to our nature, without intention. Now this takes practice and um, it takes practice. So we supposed to attain all virtue without decline and not thinking about the good and the bad and not dwell on success. So here I want to change the line, not dwell on being compliment, not dwell on the name of compassion, not dwell on the name of being kind. Chapter two echo with uh, this line here, one who is boastful, cannot be given any credit. One who is arrogant cannot last. So here I want to uh, explain this part, this Chinese character, Bu Zhang and Bu Chang. So the first one here is second intonation. It means not lasting. Not lasting. So the first one is talking about not lasting. It's like a disaster. How can our soul not lasting? Uh, it's like our our journey stop and we are stuck here. The second one is talking about no more growth. Our spiritual development supposed to be um, spiral upward. It's supposed to always be constantly growing. We have so much room to grow, so much. Right now we are in a transition of the third dimension to the fourth dimension. And it takes time to reach the seventh dimension. So we are always on this spiritual journey and hopefully we can reach that stage of Buddhahood. So we are constantly growing. So as soon as we are arrogant, we stop the growth. Our captain is being trapped in the cabin and not letting out. How can we allow that happen? We have to allow our captain to come out. One who is arrogant cannot last. Here is a famous Chinese uh, saying, Arrogance leads to loss. Modesty brings prosperity. So my question to you is, how can one last long? How can one grow continuously? The answer is in the chapter title, maintaining the permanence. Maintaining the permanence is focus our life on the right column. On the right column, which is focus our life on the true self. Make sure our life is focused on our target, and that target, it never change. It's always there. If you focus your life on the moving target, how well would you do? If you focus life on finding a girlfriend, if you focus your life on getting a job, I can promise you that once you get the job that you like, your target will move. When you achieve your, to your next job, your target will move again. So, it doesn't make sense to target ourselves onto something that's movable. 
So that answers our question. How does one last long? How does one grow? Is to focus ourselves on our higher self. Since this verse talks about one who is arrogant, in order to avoid being arrogant is to move ourselves from the center. And one example that I want to give it to you is that if you are an actor of a movie, we all have a movie that we are in. Each one of us is like a storybook. In order to do not be arrogant, is to not be so involved in the chapter or in the movie as an actor. We want to withdraw ourselves as an audience, as a reader. As soon as we withdraw ourselves as an audience or as a reader, we can see ourselves better. We can look at this actor. Is this actor following the script? Can the script be changed? How can I make the movie better? How can I rewrite my book? And if we can rewrite our book, then we won't be so arrogant. If we can rewrite our book, we will say, wait a minute, I'm doing a bad karma here. I should change my karmic seed to a good one. Instead of saying negative words, I should change my attitude to a positive one. That's my suggestion of our thinking to avoid being arrogant. So I want to give you a short story here. How can we maintain the permanence? You know what is good feng shui? Have you ever, ever heard of feng shui? Feng shui is like uh, how to arrange the environment to have uh, good energy. So there's a man who hired a feng shui master because he wants to have a good feng shui for his family cemetery. So in order to tell you the story, I want to share with you this picture here. So in Taiwan or in China, the cemetery is somehow different. In USA, the cemetery is like a park with well maintenance. And you can see greens, say in one acre, and then you will see one tree. But in Taiwan, in uh, old days, this is what the cemetery looked like. Because it's done in the old days, somehow it's now organized. And then each one of the structure represent a family cemetery. And you can see a lot of trees there, a lot, a lot of trees. So this man hired a feng shui master. Feng shui master, can you come to my family cemetery to see if we have good feng shui? The feng shui master and him walk along onto the hill. Sometimes it takes some hiking to do. So when they are halfway, they see a lot of birds flying away from the tree. And why the birds are flying away? because the birds are scared. In the cemetery, usually there's not much activity. So when a bird fly away, could it be that they are scared? So these two men saw that the birds are flying away. So this man said, oh, Feng Shui Master, let's stop here, not to go any further. Because if we go further, we are going to disturb the birds more and we are going to create a chaotic life for them in this moment. I don't want to do that. If we create a chaotic life for them, it's something small. But if somebody, oh, I'm sorry, if some bird fall from the tree, that will be a disaster. Because if a bird fall from the tree, that could be a little bird. And we don't want that to happen. And the mother bird will cry for the little bird. Let's stop right here. So this man said, okay, let's come some other time. So the Feng Shui master said, no, we don't need to come some other time. This is it. I don't need to go see your family cemetery. I'm sure that your family will be blessed from this point on. There's no need to see. And this man said, how come you haven't seen it? So the Feng Shui master said, what is a good Feng Shui? A good Feng Shui, number one, it's come from the human. Number two is the environment. It comes from us. It's the human energy that you resonate, that you send out to other people. So the number one feng shui is human. Number one, and in terms of a human perspective, first one is our mind. What kind of mind do we manifest? Everything comes from the mind. Our mind, our thought creates our speech then our speech 
creates the behavior. And of course, our behavior here comes our facial expression. Sometimes we look sad, sometimes we are happy, sometimes we are grumpy, sometimes we are angry. And it also shows up on our appearance too. So you see, our mind is so important. Through our mind, depends on how we control our mind. Our mind carries our virtue, our true self, how much you nurture your true self, how much you spend time with your true self, our spirit, and is your mind simple or not? Do you always think simplicity or your mind complicated? Do you always think about how to be compassion? Do you always think about how to be a good person? It all has to do with our mind. So this Feng Shui master said, you are such a man with good character, with so much blessing because you are concerned about the sentient being. You are concerned about a bird, not even concerned about yourself. And I'm sure you have good ancestors. Your ancestors are blessed. You are blessed. And I'm sure your descendant will be blessed. That's why I don't need to go see anymore. And this man understand. So we all know that there are some people who will spend thousands of dollars. I see people who spend $20,000 to hire a feng shui master to fix up on their furniture, to plant a tree there, to change the color of the wall, to change name, to change phone number, and to change the street address. Have you heard, heard of the people like that? And to change name, and sometimes they want to change their um, their house. They want to change the door facing the south, the north, the east, or the west. The best way to have good feng shui is to look at ourselves. How much energy can we send to other people? If you know anybody who has good feng shui, if, no, if you know anybody who is virtuous, stay with that person because whatever energy this person spread or say now, it's going to affect you. If I have bad feng shui, if I have bad energy, definitely if I call you, I'm going to dump my trash onto you. Having a good feng shui, it starts from ourselves to send out a good energy to other people. So good feng shui meaning uh, have a good positive mind, have a good attitude, being kind. And if we do that, we don't need to spend thousands of dollars on the feng shui. In speaking of Tao, this attitude are regarded as surplus food and carrying an excess burden. Here, this line here, this attitude, it means the previous four verses that we talk about, bias, assertive, boastful, and arrogant. So here, the surplus food is referring to the food that you eat. So if you are already full, I give you more food to eat, how would you feel? You're going to have a stomach ache. Can you take any more? You cannot. So those are extra food that will cause you pain, that will cause you have a physical struggle. Before the pandemic, I used to go to a buffet and they are not cheap, $50 a person. And I try to eat as much as I can. And then uh, there are a few times that I overeat and I cannot get up. And I tell my husband, just wait, I have to walk around. <laughs> So it's very painful if we eat extra. And uh, the next one is uh, carrying extra burden. So if we carry extra burden, it's the same as tiptoe. How long can you walk? You cannot walk too long. And how far can you walk? You cannot walk too far because it's just too much. Imagine if we have obesity, if we are fat, how long can we walk? We cannot walk too much. So many things despise this. this means um, this kind of attitude, which is this four here. Thus, the man of Tao will stay away from this attitude. So of course, people who have this attitude, they resonate bad feng shui, bad energy. We want to stay away from them in order to conserve our uh, bad energy. But um, I want to say that even people who have bad energy, if possible, it's our responsibility to stay with them. It will be a miracle if you can transform their bad energy to good energy. Can we all do that? Can we not to abandon our friend? If our friend has bad energy, can we turn things around to help him? That will be good karma too. But I want to say that if you are shaky, if you are 
in the state of a uh, spiritual deficiency. Sometimes I feel low. Sometimes my spiritual battery is low. I cannot do that. If my spiritual battery is low, I have a hard time doing it myself. How can I help others? So um, the same thing is uh, helping people with a financial need. If we can help other people financially, if we are capable. If we are not capable, I don't recommend you to get along to help other people. So this verse applies to have a balance between spiritual deficiency and spiritual sufficiency. So there's really a thin line between if we are capable of helping. If we cannot help, it's okay to say no. But if we are capable of helping, that will be good merit. This line resonates with chapter eight. The greatest virtue is like water. High is founded in low, being noble is humble. So all this attitude is not considered the virtue of water. All this attitude are considered sharp edges, consider self-centered. So we want to practice the opposite which is like the virtue of, so we almost come to the end. So here again, this is the intro. Lao Zi introduced the four things on the four luggage that we shouldn't carry in life by having this tool as an opening line. So besides this four, can we think about any other luggage that we shouldn't take? Discrimination, judgment, hate, Greed, illusion, and what else? Ignorance, what else? Being selfish. Oh, I want to add one more thing, attachment, attachment. Sometimes we are attached to our childhood trauma. Some of us have childhood trauma. What I mean by attachment, because we all have our bad moment. We all have our bad memory. We all have our bad experience. But the more you think about it, the more you dwell on that, you are fostering that memory into a bigger size. And the more you think about it, that little monster will become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I remember when I was younger age, before I practiced Tao, I would say, Joanna, today is a sad day. I'm going to spend a few hours thinking about my bad experience. And then I will think about it for a few minutes, few minutes turn to one hour, one hour turn to two hours. And then what happens to the end of the day? <laughs> I become a depressed person. So this is called attached to our bad memory, attachment to our childhood trauma, attachment to our loved one who passed in our life. Think about those attachments, those experience, those memories should just be an album for us to look at look at it but do not dwell on that so actually it's not just this four it's a lot but Lao Tzu just these this four because probably these four are the most common one people tend to fall into so we want to remove ourselves from the center so that we can be selfless and once we can remove all our luggage then we can go to heaven because the flight to heaven is luggage free. If X is broken by outside force, life ends. If broken by inside force, life begins. So great things always begin from inside. Cultivations begin from inside. Maintaining the permanence, maintaining our true self, maintaining our inner self, our inner nature, it starts from inside, not from outside. Here I conclude my session of chapter 24. I want to give a special thanks to editor Robert M. Jenko, who is one of our participants here, to help me to go through the slides to make sure everything is smooth. And um, I thank your time and participation. And um, on this journey of Tao, I hope that we can all walk together do not feel alone. We are here together. We will hold each other's hand and we will go to Tushita heaven together. Thank you so much. And that concludes my session. If mistakes were made or say during today's sharing, I ask the forgiveness from the Heavenly Mother, Buddha Mitreya, Qigong Buddha, Patriarch, Sujun Simu, Grand Master, Senior Master Lee, and Junior Master Lee. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.